Firstly, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I remember a few years ago I spoke at an event in Hermavon, and the moderator at that event introduced me as uh, the Irish man who's been to more places in Sweden than most Swedish people. Uh, but I've never been to Luxilla, so this is very nice. And I actually remember after that event as well, I got a present of the uh, Voster, Vosterbotten Ost. So I've tasted your lovely cheese as well. Um, yeah, my name is Tom. I'm a director and a part owner of this company, IC Aviation Limited, which I will explain in a little bit more detail in just a few minutes. Let me go on like this. Yeah, the theme of my presentation is how a vision can lift. Um, it may sound like a little bit of a vague concept, and I guess it is a little bit of a, a vague concept, but I'm not talking about this from the psychological perspective. I'm not talking about this in terms of how people react or what people's minds are trained to do. I'm talking about this first and foremost from the aviation perspective, uh, and secondly, just the experiences that I've had in the aviation sector that have led me to believe that uh, having a vision uh, can be a very good place to start. It doesn't always get you exactly where you want to go, but it can certainly be a very good place to start. So, I'll go on with this one. Who am I? I have a confession to make at the very start. Uh, I have a, an extreme love affair with Sweden. Um, in my professional life, I spend a lot of time in Sweden at the moment, but my love affair with Sweden, in fact, started a long time ago, long, long time ago, when I was a law student in a university in Ireland, and uh, I was lucky enough that in the year, when I was in my second year of law school, uh, they opened up this program for 16 students to go and study overseas. And I applied for this program, and I was successful, so they called me into the office to say, uh, well, congratulations, you've been chosen, and you'll be going to Uppsala. And I was, well, <laughs> where? <laughs> where is Uppsala? So anyway, I went off to Sweden, and I have to say I spent um, probably the most enjo enjoyable year of my life uh, studying. Uh, I did a little bit of study, but um, I did quite a few other things as well. Um, but that was my introduction to Sweden, and it's, uh, it's entirely coincidental that I find myself now in a professional capacity spending a lot of time in Sweden. It's really nothing to do with the fact that I studied in Sweden. As you may have also guessed, I didn't exactly... Uh, perfect the Swedish language when I was studying there. So, Jakob Brotte Litis Fenskim, and I have a lot of learning still to do. So, the, uh, as, the, as the moderator has said, I, I got into the aviation business by working for Ryanair, and I went straight from my studies into Ryanair, uh, thinking I knew everything because I had a law degree and I'd done a master's in business studies, and I thought that, you know, I, I could handle any situation, but I soon learned that, uh, that the real world, the professional world, is quite a different place uh, to sitting at a desk studying. But I want to talk about Ryanair from the perspective of just Ryanair, because if you want to uh, think about a vision, if you want to contemplate a company that has broken more boundaries than any other company I know, in particular in the aviation sector, but I would argue that they've broken boundaries across the board in the way that they've done things, uh, so I just want to tell you a little bit and talk a little bit about Ryanair, the company, because it is in itself, nothing to do with me, it is in itself a very, very interesting story. In 1985, it was set up by the Ryan family, and it operated on a very, very old propeller aircraft from a town in the southeast of Ireland called Waterford, which I assume most people have never heard of, uh, to London, right? Uh, at that time, they had one aircraft, and they were carrying about 5,000 passengers a year. Now, if you jump forward just 10 years, they suddenly started flying from Dublin Airport, the capital of Ireland, and they suddenly became the biggest carrier, uh, beating Aer Lingus, which is the Irish national carrier, and British Airways, to become the largest airline on the Dublin-London route. And that is, in fact, was and still is the busiest international route in Europe. And what Ryanair did single-handedly by coming on to that particular route uh, was really revolutionize air transport for Irish people because before 1995, you expected to pay somewhere around three or 400 Irish pounds, which in today's money is probably more than 1,000 euro, I would say, to fly for one hour from, from Dublin to London. Ryanair came in and started offering fares from just 30 pounds. And from then on, they have done that, replicated that right across Europe. They have replicated that uh, bringing competition to the market can be a good thing. Of course, 
The established airlines are not going to agree with me on that, and I can understand why they wouldn't. But the fact of the matter is, they have opened up the European aviation market and made it affordable and possible for more people than ever to fly. If you jump forward to 2005, which incidentally was the year that I joined Ryanair, you can see uh, they've suddenly grown to 65 aircraft, and they're now carrying 35 million passengers a year. So in just 20 years, they've gone from one aircraft and 5,000 passengers to carrying 35 million passengers a year. Uh, and this is when they really started to become a player in the European aviation sector. A lot of people had written them off as a kind of a cowboy Irish company uh, who were never going to last. And uh, th they, they had good reason to think that way because the very colorful chief executive, Michael O'Leary, um, was known for saying inappropriate things at times to politicians and to other airlines. So he wasn't the most popular, still isn't the most popular. If you look at Ryanair today, again, they've gone from strength to strength. They carry 120 million passengers every year on more than 1,800 daily flights. So every single day, there are 1,800 Ryanair flights taking off and landing all over Europe. They now have a network of 84 bases, connecting 200 destinations in some 33 countries. They have a fleet of 350 Boeing 737 aircraft. I should also add that their aircraft are amongst the newest in the world. They have one of the lowest fleet age in, in the world at the moment, with a fleet age of about two, two and a half years uh, old. And they have another 300 or so aircraft still to come in with their new order that they have with Boeing. If anybody has ever looked into Ryanair in any way, or if you've ever sort of a, uh, kind of uh, done a little bit of research on their financial um, criteria, you will see that they are often quoted as being the most financially secure airline in the world, not only in Europe. They are in Europe by quite a long distance, but also right across the world. Uh, this year, they're projecting to uh, make a net profit, a net profit of almost 1.4 billion euro. In aviation, well, in any sector, that's a pretty good result. But in aviation terms in Europe, you have to understand that that is nothing short of remarkable. There are no airlines making that sort of money. There are airlines losing one billion in a single quarter, but there are no airlines making 1.4 billion net profit. And they also have a rather healthy 1.2 billion in cash on their, on their balance sheet. And they have growth projections up to 180 million passengers per annum by 2024. And if you look at their historic growth trends and if you look at their current market position, their financial position, there's nothing to suggest that they won't achieve those, um, those growth targets. Just to give you some context, because it's easy for me to understand that 120 million passengers is a lot of passengers. Uh, that's fairly straightforward because I kind of understand the industry. But I just want to show you, Lufthansa would be the second biggest carrier by passenger numbers in Europe, and they carry about 107 million. IAG Group, which is the International Airlines Group, there are four airlines in that group, one of whom is British Airways, Iberia, Vueling, and now the Irish airline, Aer Lingus. And even with that, with four airlines combined, they carry 95 million passengers. Air France KLM, two airlines joined, 79 million. And then if you bring it back to a more local level for yourselves, looking at Scandinavian airlines, they have about 31 million passengers. Uh, Norwegian, about 21, 26 million passengers. So the growth has been phenomenal. The comp company is phenomenal. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt about it. And when we talk about a vision, there you go. <laughs> that's, that's quite a vision. I guess you all know who that is, right? Yeah, that is, uh, that is indeed uh, Michael O'Leary. Now, you don't have to love this guy. In fact, you don't even have to like this guy, and a lot of people don't. But uh, I, I'm, I'm simply talking about this in the context of this man is a visionary, whether you like him or not, or whether you love him or not. He is a visionary, and he has done things in the aviation sector that will last forever. And I would argue these things are in the interests of Irish or European consumers, European businesses. So that leads me to when I left... Uh, Ryanair, I started this company, IC Aviation Limited. Now, our vision at the time was to help regional airports to develop, right? That was our business model. Uh, and in order, or in doing so, if a regional airport is developing, then it powers the local economy where that airport is based, and it empowers the economy where that airport is based. And I always say, if you are ever looking at a regional economic development plan, Start with the airport. Look at the airport first, because it is absolutely staggering what a local airport, even a small airport, can do for a local economy, for a regional economy. 
People often view airports simply as an exit or entry point for people coming to visit a region or people going on holiday down to the south of Spain to their holiday homes or down to the sea. But if you think of it, if you're a small business growing, even if you're a sta an established business growing, your access to international markets makes a massive difference. Effective access to international markets makes a huge difference as to how your business will develop and grow uh, in the future. And your abilities and your opportunities are so much more if you've got effective uh, airborne connectivity to international markets. Now, I don't want to get into statistics too much, and I certainly don't want to bore you, but I do want to give you just some uh, examples of how valuable small airports can be. And these are three case studies from Sweden to keep it local. Um, in the Vester Norland region, there are three airports, two very small airports, and one reasonable sized airport. So you've got Kramforce with around 20,000 passengers per annum, Sundsvall with about 28, 280,000 passengers per annum, and then Ornholzvik with around 80,000 passengers per annum. These three airports, quite small as they are, still bring over half a billion in Swedish kroner to the local economy in that area. And for every one Swedish kroner invested in the airports brings a return of something like 15 Swedish kroner. So it's a pretty good investment. It's a pretty sound investment. If you're a regional planner, if you're an economic planner for the region, there is no better investment. Th it's, I mean, it's proven. This is just one case study. I can show you many, many more from all over Europe and indeed all over the world that demonstrates the power of airports and the power of aviation to drive local economies. Again, another study, Kalmar down in the southeast of Sweden, a uh, slightly bigger airport, about 220,000 passengers per annum. And this particular study looked at two different scenarios. If the airport maintained as it was, the status quo, and if the airport was closed down. Again, this airport in a reasonably small area in Sweden delivers some 56 million in Swedish crowns to the regional economy per annum as it currently is, and if the airport was to close, there'd be 70 to 100 jobs lost in the, the direct employment, in the immediate vicinity of the airport, and many more indirect. Again, repeated here in, in Vastaros, again, sort of smallish airport, 150,000 passengers per annum. Uh, airport closure would lead to the loss of 33.2 million Swedish crowns in the region. Um, in 2010, the airport brought something like 4,500 tourists uh, that brought 7.6 million uh, in tourism spend. And the employment in the local area and surrounding areas because of the airport is worth something like 60.3 million Swedish crowns. So again, just to put it in context, you don't have to have an Orlando hub in order to be able to generate strong economic activity from an airport. These airports are moderate to small airports, yet they still deliver massive economic benefits to the areas where they're located. And that's why I say, if you're looking at developing a region, start with the airport. And that's what our vision or our business model was at the very start, we could clearly see that there was a gap in the market to help regional airports to develop the airport primarily because that's our expertise. We're not economic experts by any stretch, uh, but we do know how to develop airports. So if we can develop the airport, that will have a good positive impact for the long term for the local region. So we started IC Aviation with that vision in mind. As I say, we are primarily known as aviation consultants, whereby we help airports to develop. This business grew pretty well over the first three years. We were working in some 11 European countries, and we had a range of clients who were the airports themselves, but in some cases we had national governments uh, who we were advising as to how they should plan for the long-term future for the airports in their country. Uh, and we've worked with a lot of regional airports in Scandinavia and also tourist boards. And we started developing quite a long, uh, quite a strong uh, record of success. We got a lot of new flight connections to regional airports all over Scandinavia and also in other parts of Europe. However, nothing is plain sailing in business. And after about, I guess it was in about year three, we were starting to realize uh, quite clearly that there was big challenges in the European aviation market. And it was becoming harder and harder for us to do our job. And airports would come to us or a region would come to us and say, okay, we need a direct connection to Frankfurt or we need a direct connection to London or whatever it is. And it was becoming very, very difficult for us to do that. And these are just some of the reasons why. I mean, airports, <laughs> as valuable as they are to local economies, they're notoriously unprofitable. Uh, and almost half of all Europe's airports are loss making. It's very hard to run a small airport on a profitable basis because you've got a lot of very high fixed overhead costs. And unless you've got a lot of people, a lot of passengers using the airport, it's very hard to get a return or to spread the, the, 
uh, to cover the costs, uh, the, the high fixed costs. In addition, there was a lot of airline bankruptcies at around this time, in particular regional airlines. So something like 33% of all regional airlines in Europe went bankrupt between 2008 and 2013. So, and, and another very important point here, of course, and you've, you've seen this um, with Sheleftio, when Ryanair started flying to Sheleftio, and this was great, really good news for the region. Uh, you know, tourists were coming up from Spain, and then you got a connection to London, and it was all very good, but then, of course, Ryanair changed their strategy and just disappeared. So all of the good work that had been done and all of the investments that had been done to capitalize and to take advantage of those routes was just gone. And, and airlines are acting in that way. They will do what's best for them. And as businessmen, and in order to make sure that they're profitable, you can understand that to an extent. But from a regional perspective, it's very difficult to accept that. So anyway, what did we do? We decided to address the problem by setting up a new Nordic travel company. Uh, we couldn't do it any other way. And we'd been you know, really trying to negotiate with airlines to fly to these locations, and we'd been trying to come up with different solutions, and it just wasn't really working. So we came up with this concept, which is now called Go To Nordics. And this is not a brand that you will know very well at the moment. In fact, you've probably never heard of it. But uh, I am very hopeful that in, in the not too distant future, you will be hearing about it more and more. Because essentially, we are a Nordic travel group. We already have operations out of Norway. So we offer outbound flights and holidays from a city called Hogesen in Norway. And we have run flights to Bremen in Germany. We've run flights to Pisa. And uh, we currently have flights from London to Hogesen operating at the moment under the GoTo Nordics brand. And in addition to giving people living in an area the, possible to fly, the possibility to fly to new and interesting destinations, we will also be encouraging people to come to these destinations. So flying from, for example, Italy to Norway, or flying from Germany to Norway. So we really took the, uh, we took the problem into our own hands. And um, we've been talking to a lot of different regional airports and presenting this type of model to them. And people are very interested in it. And that's why, as I say, I hope that at some point in the future, this brand, Go To Nordics, will become a little bit more familiar in this part of, uh, in this part of the world. So now I take you to the next step on our journey. Um, I have to say, this one wasn't in the vision or the business plan. But uh, nevertheless, we are uh, extremely honored to be uh, associated with BioCool. And I'm sure you all have heard of BioCool. And if you haven't, you should. Um, the lovely Maria, the CEO of BioCool, is here in the audience. And we have uh, recently signed an agreement to become distributors for BioCool products into Ireland and the UK. So we are just starting this journey. And in fact, it's quite interesting timing because next week will be the official launch of BioCool in Ireland. And I can show you just a quick, uh, a quick video clip. This hasn't even been shown in Ireland yet, so you're getting a, you're getting a sneak preview over here. Let's see if this works. BioCool has come to Ireland and to celebrate, they're giving you and a friend the chance to win a wonderful winter holiday with thanks to Visit Skeleftio. All BioCool products are completely natural and environmentally friendly and treat a variety of skin conditions like psoriasis and eczema. These can also be used to improve your foot health while being suitable for diabetics. BioCool can be used by everyone in the family, including children and pregnant women, and can be found at a pharmacy near you or at www.biocool.ie. This week's prize will see a lucky viewer jetting off to Skeleptio in Swedish Lapland with return flights, three nights B&B, snowmobile safari, unique wilderness experience, and a chance to attend the Winter Swimming World Cup, a real winter wonderland. For your chance to win this fabulous prize, simply answer the following question. Santa Claus and his reindeer live in Poland, New Zealand, Lapland. That's a Just difficult question for us. Just call 712 or text WIN to 57003 to enter. Good luck. Yeah, so uh, next February there will be two very innocent Irish people coming up to, uh, to, explore, to explore this region. Uh, so it's very exciting. So yeah, I mean, again, it's just, um, it, it's a very, yeah, I'm going to finish with this. Do you know this guy? Another, another famous entrepreneur. His name is Henry Ford of, uh, of Ford Motors. And uh, he has some fantastic quotes. If you ever got time, you should look at some of the things that he said, because he has some really, really interesting, uh, 
interesting things to say, but my favorite one that he says is, if you always do what you've always done, you will always get what you've always got. And uh, I, I take a lot of uh, encouragement from this because you know, starting a business is never easy. It's never straightforward. But one thing I've learned for sure is that you continue to do, if you meet tough times, challenging times, if you keep doing what you've been doing, you're probably not going to find your way out of the situation very easily. So it's always good to be innovative. It's always good to be flexible. It's always good to be ready to react. But at the very, very start of it all, never be afraid to have the vision in the first place. You need to be able to react, but never be afraid to have that vision. And I hope that today you've learned a little bit about Ryanair, you've learned a little bit about our company, and I certainly hope that uh, I get the chance to come here again because it's uh, fantastic being part of such an interesting group, young companies, established companies, and the fantastic entrepreneurial spirit that is being encouraged here, and the, the no plan B. I didn't, couldn't follow all of what was happening. I'd love to hear a little bit more about it, actually, because it does sound like a, a really fantastic initiative. So I wish you all the very best, all the young businesses, the uh, growing businesses, the established businesses, and um, look forward to meeting you all properly later on. Thank you very much.